going to get my shirt here. Bring it on here. Hello. <laughs> We're here. So just a reminder to everyone to mute your uh, mic so we won't be distracted by that. Um, yeah, so welcome to Botany Geek Evening. I know some of you are kind of cold places and hopefully it'll perk you up a little bit to see lots of photos of plants and plant parts at this time of year. And I, I know some of you are new to plant terminology. And for others, this is probably a bit of a review. And my goal this evening, especially for those of you that are new to the topic, is to provide an overview of some of the types of plant characters you'll encounter as you deepen your plant uh, studies. Um, and uh, I just want to say that this, this is a huge topic. Um, there's literally hundreds of terms and it, it's one of those things like scales and in, in learning any musical instrument it, it takes a bit of practice but it's also true that once you get over the hump a bit with it um, it becomes easier and, and pretty soon as you're keying out plants you find that you're having to look up less and less plants actually i just want to check lance is the volume on my uh, vocal okay or is it, yep, is it loud, for me. loud enough? Okay, good. Yeah, just uh, raise your hand in the little chat and Lance can let me know if it's not loud enough. So in order to cover this broad topic in one evening, what I'll be doing is uh, just kind of talking about the kinds of things you encounter and give you examples of each type and some specific species examples. So you kind of have a sense of it. And then also I'll be talking about both printed references and um, online references so that you'll have some materials to refer to as we go forward. And just a reminder, this uh, these talk series are hosted by Golden Hills, the Resource Conservation and Development, and then uh, I'm from Ecological Strategies. And one of the reasons that we, we talked about having this class was because uh, Golden Hills has been offering some amazing courses on plant ID, and it seemed like having a little bit of a support for some of the terms would help people get more out of those classes and be able to, to uh, keep up a bit. So when we talk, when we say plant terminology, what we're really talking about for this particular class is plant morphology. And that's the physical form and external structure of plants. Uh, so that's things that, things you'd kind of think of, leaves and stems and flowers and seeds and roots. There's, of course, lots of other things to know about plants, like the internal structures of plants, xylem and phloem, and uh, how water moves, and all kinds of physiology. But specifically tonight, we're looking at plant morphology because it's plant morphology is the element of uh, botanical sciences that you need to know to identify plants properly. Um, and I should mention that. Uh, I say scientific terms. So these are all the Latin and Greek and other words that. Uh, you hear for these these different plant parts and um, there's a lot of them so just for example for hairs and surface features this is just one page showing some of the different terms and don't worry we'll go over some of these <laughs> in more detail do some of the different terms you can encounter and just about everybody I know and including myself at some point when you're trying to learn plant terms you, it, it kind of hits you go why can't we just say the leaf is hairy you know, do we have to have all these terms for hairs? And the answer is, yes, we do. And the reason we do is because there are a lot of different kinds of hairs and the, those characters help us identify which species of plant it is, along with all these other characters. So kind of sticking on the theme of hairs for a little bit, um, here's, here's a few kinds that we run across. Oops, sorry about that. Um, one of the uh, stellate hairs are really kind of cool little things. They're star shaped, as the name would imply, and they can either be on a little stalk with a little star on top, or uh, what we would call sessile or adnate to the stem, so just flat on the stem or leaf. And then uh, another type of hair is called glandular hair. And these again have a little stalk and a little kind of clear, usually clear or sometimes colored translucent um, ball 
on top. And, um, and then another kind of hair, which is kind of more similar to what you typically think of as a hair is her suit. But the thing is there's uh, even the kind of hairs that you think are typically look like hairs, uh, there's different types. And so in this case, her suit means a thick covering of stiff hairs. Um, and that's kind of compared with things like purulent, which is, uh, this image is not that great, but you can tell it's like more of a soft, little fine soft hairs are down. And then, uh, or another type of hair, strigos, which means it's covered with stiff oppressed hairs, which are kind of crooked or bent. And, you know, throughout this talk, again, I don't imagine you'll remember all these, but just to know that there's these different types of hairs. And when you're keying a plant out or um, trying to figure out which species it is, you, you want to be aware of that. And, they, and it says, you know, prebrilliant hairs or strigos hairs, then that's when you look, get, go to one of the references if you don't know that type and you can see what they're referring to. So again, just to give some examples of some of these hair types. Um, the stellate hairs that we saw the drawing for. So nine bark, there's a, um, a variety called intermedius. And one of the characters to kind of tell what that variety is has stellate hairs. So if you look, this is actually part of sort of the dried fruit. It has little stellate hairs all over it. And then here's a close up. You can kind of see what that little stellate hair looks like. Um, then another type of hair we, we talked about a little bit was glandular hairs. So for example, wild red raspberry has these really cool glandular hairs. They can be kind of reddish. Here's a, here's a clo close up of a gen, uh, glandular hair generally, uh, not specifically the raspberry. But, you know, uh, for example, with the wild raspberry, why knowing that it has glandular hairs is useful is that let's say you wanted to move some raspberry plants into your garden or into a native planting and you specifically wanted red raspberries or you wanted the black cap raspberries, one of the characters to tell those apart are the glandular hairs. So you, you could, without having fruits on the plant, that would be one way you could say, oh, that's most likely a red raspberry. So that's where things like some of these detailed characters really come in handy. Uh, another case is, with grasses, this is a hairy grandma is a, a prairie grass. And um, there's a lot of folks doing prairie restoration now. And one of the things that'll happen with prairie restoration is that for uh, a couple of years, you may not see any flowers or fruit on the grasses. And you're thinking, well, are they are there native plants in there or not? How do I tell one native plant from the other? Or in another case, if you happen to be a plant professional in this talk and you're doing work in a grazed prairie where you don't have any tops, it gets tricky. And so some of the kinds of things you can rely on are hairs and venation. And so um, this particular type of hair is called a papillos hair. And you can see it's a kind of a long thin hair, but the important part is there's like a bit of a ball shape on the end. And it's called the papillos hair. And those, there's a couple of Budalua species that have those, and then a lot of other grasses don't. So that can be or, you know, even though it's a teeny little character, it can really be a nice one to grab onto. And then uh, the node of a grass, which is sort of the area between the leaves, that little hard place on a grass, a lot of times those have really characteristic hairs as well. So those are, those are useful things if you're in that, those kind of situations. Um, another type of hair uh, is called tomentos, and it's basically dense woolly hairs. And you can see this is the bottom of a, a woolly syncofoil. So this is the underside of the leaf. And these are literally just packed tight little white hairs. And um, again, knowing that you've got that, like if you're going through the botanical keys, there'll it'll likely be a point where it says under surface covered with dense, you know, well, tomentose hairs, most likely. If you're lucky, it might say dense woolly hairs, but really often it'll be tomentose. And so then in this case, if you remember what tomentose hairs are, great. If not, you go to the, one of the references I talked about, look it up and go, oh yeah, I've got those, I've got those kind of hairs happening. Um, so why can we just say it, Terry? Because we we can't <laughs> because there's over like 30 types of hairs found on plants just in the Midwest. And 
when you get into the botanical keys, which if you if you want to dig into botany deeper, that is you know the direction that you want to go because that's ultimately the way to tell the different species from each other reliably. Then keys like Gleason and Cronquist, Flora of North America, Michigan Flora. This is just a few. They will have you know um, these kinds of terms, and you'll need to use those to key plants out. And like I mentioned before. It's daunting at first, but pretty quickly you start to get, get the hang of it. And then another good reason, I, and I mentioned this before, is that some of the terms used in courses at Golden Hills and other organizations, if you can get a few of those under your belt, then you'll just get that much more um, out of the class as you take it. So I'll uh, mention a few resources. One resource is this book, uh, Plant Identification Terminology. And um, the reason I recommend this book is, is a couple of things. One is it's extremely comprehensive. There's all kinds of online resources, um, but I haven't honestly found anything quite as comprehensive as this. Also, notice it says illustrated glossary. And as we all know, there's nothing like a picture. Um, and, and also I find just personally, when I'm peeing out plants, I typically have a couple of my botanical keys sitting on the desk or table. I have my dissecting scope, and it's just handy to have the plant terminology book there and I'll have to jump up and go to my computer. Um, so that's another reason. It's uh, arranged in kind of a useful way in that it has an alphabetical glossary in the beginning. So if you run across a term like tomentos that we saw a few minutes ago, you can look that up and it'll tell you what type of hairs those are. But also it has terms by category. And so uh, basically, it'll say like uh, it has a whole category for leaf types, leaf uh, margins, leaf shapes. And so if you're in the key, botanical key, and you're kind of trying to figure out what are they referring to, you can go to that section, look at a bunch of different leaf types, and it will help you determine what the key is talking about. Um, I did send online resources in a PDF format. So um, those of you that successfully got the emails and didn't, didn't go to junk mail or something, you should have that. And I'll go over those a little bit at the end of this talk too. And I guess Lance, I could let you know if they didn't receive that, right? Okay. Um, there's a few places during the talk, if you see this plant terms page number, there's a few places where uh, I referenced the page number on this book, just so that you can kind of follow, follow along. Um, so, when we talk about morphology, uh, it's kind of handy to divide it into a couple groups. So reproductive structures. So things like flowers, fruits, seeds, and also uh, vegetative reproduction. So that'd be things like stolons and runners like you would have on a strawberry. And then vegetative structures, which, you know, things that are pretty common sense, leaves, stems, and roots. Um, I don't get too much into roots simply because, well, simply because there's an awful lot to go over and I'm trying to hit the highlights and, and just give you some of the, what I feel like the most commonly encountered um, morphological features you run into. It is, I think, important to mention that there's these sort of broad types of plants. So there's non-vascular spore plants, um, vascular spore plants, naked seeds, flowering plants. And these broad groups of plants will have quite different characters. So if you think about, so non-vascular spore plants, your mosses, they're gonna have different plant uh, characteristics than your spore plants, your ferns, and then naked seed plants, which are gymnosperms, so your pines, your spruce, your fir, they're gonna have different flowering and seed types than your sort of classic flowering plants. And again, um, just to kind of make sure that we, we you know, cover some things fairly well and not too much, I will um, kind of focus on plant morphology. Um, and uh, sorry, not plant morphology, flower morphology. So um, some of you, I, I mean, I think just about all of us had this in basic biology, but since some, for some of us that's been a while, and just as a starting point, I want to review just the kind of quintessential basic flower parts. So starting on the left, uh, the male flower parts are collectively called the stamen. So when I say collectively, that's the anther and the filament. 
And so the anther is the part that's got the pollen. And then the filament is basically just its little support structure that, uh, and also provides nutrients. And then, and then again, collectively, the male parts are called stamens. Then the uh, female parts are called uh, either carpal or pistils uh, collectively. And then within that, there's really kind of three main parts, which is a stigma, which is the top part here that collects the pollen, the style, which the pollen is actually going to travel down, and then the ovary. And then within the ovary, you've got the ovule. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then you've got your cotoclastic flower parts, which are petals, typically colorful, but not always. And then uh, what are called sepals. And again, this is sort of the, the stylized version, which are they're tip, often green below the petals. They can be a little more uh, leafy looking. Uh, but you'll see as we, we go through the talk that there's an awful kinds of, a lot of different kinds of sepals and petals. And then this receptacle is kind of the, the sort of older of the flower parts, if you will. And then the little stem on there is called the peduncle. So those are your basic flower parts. And then from there, oh, just, yeah, I want to say one other thing, which is the petals collectively are called the corolla. And uh, then the sepals collectively are called the calyx. Um, again, from that kind of that sort of typical flower type, though, so, um, quickly we realize that there's lots of other shapes and forms that flowers can take. And you can see there's, you know, kind of a daisy type here, and then there's tubular ones, and there's orchids. And, and so I'll just talk about a couple of those different types. So um, one common form is called funnel form. And, you know, it's well named because it's like a little funnel that you put gas in your car with if you run out of gas <laughs> and, uh, and that so uh, in our area things like field bindweed morning glories are flowers that are going to have that funnel form flower uh, another type of uh, shape of uh, corolla is the tubular this is a uh, false foxglove it's a native plant in Minnesota in the midwest and then there's a uh, the milkweeds, which have a, or if you haven't looked at them close, they have a really amazing corolla type. And um, so their petals, they've got typical petals, but they're often reflex, so they're kind of bent, as you can see here. And, um, and then they have what's called a hood and a horn. And I'll show you a couple of images of that. So here's, here's like the little hood and the horn's kind of inside there. The next image shows that a little bit better. So here's looking down on a milkweed flower. So this would be the little hood part, and that's the little horn. So that's obviously, you know, a unique structure to uh, the milkweeds. And if you were keying out milkweeds, it would ask you things about the shape and the size and the color of the hoods and the horns. Um, and then you can see that, like the stigma here is, is much broader than some flowers. And so you start to get into more specialized features. Um, another thing that's important to know about well, we talked about the um, female parts being the stigma, the style, and the ovary. And um, something that, is, again, is a character that you run into is the placement of that ovary in relation to, these is like a stylized petal, and this is a stylized sepal. So in this case, the ovary is basically above where the petal and the sepal attach. So that's called the superior ovary or hypogenous. Then on the other uh, side of that equation, you've got the ovary is kind of tucked down in here and the petals and the sepals come off the top of that. So that's called an inferior ovary. And then there's things that are kind of half between and those are called half inferior or perigenous. And I'll give you some examples of these so it makes a little more sense. So for example, in the rose family, I think everybody's familiar with uh, rose hips probably. And um, you can see that that's an inferior ovary because let me go back just one sec. That would be below the sepals and petal um, because here are the little old sepals still hanging on here. So as that ovary gets fertilized and the seeds and everything grow, they're still hanging on there. So that tells you, yep, that's inferior. It's below those parts. And then in contrast, uh, the lychnis or the pink family there's like an evening lichnus weed, I think a lot of people are familiar with. This is, the flower's been cut in half, so you can kind of see what's happening there. 
There, on this case, is the superior ovary because here's where the petals come off and the sepals uh, down here. And so that little ovary is on top of where that attachment is. So that's gonna be your superior ovary. So that's um, something to know about ovary location. Another thing with flowers that's uh, you know, good to have a sense of is uh, what's called symmetry. So radial symmetry is like if you had a, like a mandala, meditation mandala, and you can draw a line through you know, pretty much any one of these petals and both sides are gonna be the same. And any, actually anywhere you draw the line is the same as anywhere else. So I think that's kind of common sense. But then uh, maybe less obvious is the, the type of flower called bilateral symmetry, where if you draw a line down the middle, then the two halves match each other. And so that's, that's like a, a person's face is bilateral symmetry. And a couple examples of that kind of thing. So wood lily is your radial symmetry. Again, you can draw a line anywhere and it'll all be the same. Whereas if you look at the foxglove, your tongue, you'd have, if you draw a line right through here, it's the only place you can draw it to have those two sides be kind of mirror image of each other. So radial versus bilateral symmetry. A um, couple other things that flowers do, and they do a lot of things, but here's a couple other things they do, is uh, remember in the stylized flower, the sepals were green and the petals were colorful, and that's all tidy, but they do all kinds of other things. And so in an iris, the sepal can be larger and colorful, and you see the petal, petal is still colorful, but small. And then you can see that the stigmas and the anthers, anthers are doing all kinds of goofy things. So just to be aware that when you look at flowers and if it says sepal colorful or sepal larger, that, that, that is, that's reasonable. They can do that. Um, then just changing, you know, changing it up even a little bit more, just gonna zoom on here, is if you go to um, a pea family flower, and then again, this part of this flower has been cut away so you can see inside of it. The, the form of a pea flower is unique enough that they've named the different parts and um, and that those would be characters again that you run across in the key. So uh, the petals are named the banner, which is the one that kind of comes up like this. Wings, which there's two of, there's one off this way and then there'd be one here, which they took off to see the inside. So the, the banner, the wing, and then this kind of inside petal structure, which is the keel. And then you can see that the pistils and the stamens are doing all kinds of different things. So the pistils, it's actually few stamens. And then the pistils kind of tuck down in here. And then there's a situation where there's one free stamen. So again, all the basic parts are there, but it's you know shifted from that you know kind of quintessential flower. Um, this is second. And then so now we've looked at pretty much individual flowers so far, but a lot of flowers are in various forms of clusters. And those clusters would be called inflorescence types. And um, again, there's a whole bunch of those. If you look in the plant terms book, it's, uh, it starts about 175. And uh, these are kind of stylized versions of inflorescence types. And I'll show you some examples so you can have a, a sense of what, what kinds of things to look for. So the parsley family, I think people are pretty familiar with that. Carrots, water hemlock, angelica. Um, they have what's called an umbel. And it's actually named uh, because it's similar to an umbrella. And you've got this central attachment point with these little kind of uh, spokes or pedicels that come out and then little flowers on the end of those pedicels. I'll give you some other photos of this. So, Here's a simple umbel where you've just got pretty much like an umbrella, the, the, each one of these little spokes coming out with a flower on top. And our milkweed would be an example of that. So here's kind of the central part, little stalk, little flower. And then um, there can also be compound umbels where you've got the uh, pedicels coming out, but then you've got clusters of flowers on the ends of those. So um, that's just something to be aware of. A really cool kind of uh, uh, inflorescence arrangement is uh, the spathe and spadix, which is associated with the arum or ericaceae family, which is uh, your jack in the pulpit, skunk cabbage. And this 
you know, look at this, you think that's a flower and it is, but actually it's an inflorescence in that these are all, it's clusters of flowers. So a bunch of teeny little flowers. Uh, and we, I think, I'm, yeah, so this, so the spathe would be this sort of big wrap around part and the spadix is that part in the central with the little flowers. So in this particular flower, this has a whole bunch of small flowers on it. Hence, that's an, actually the whole thing would be considered an inflorescence or a cluster of flowers, not just one flower. So this plant, which is, uh, oopsie, sorry, um, uh, Titan arum is one of the largest, not flowers in the world, but one of the largest inflorescences in the world. And this thing can get like four or five feet tall. I've seen them, they're huge, they're amazing, and they um, smell terrible. Um, then another form is the composites. And they, uh, like it sounds, they're a cluster of flowers. So let's get uh, onto this example of that. And um, what's happening here is, again, you see kind of typical petals, but actually each petal in this, in this outer ring here has got, it's got one little petal and a teeny little flower, typically female, or it can be sterile too. And um, those are called ray florets because they're kind of rays around the edge. Then um, in the center part, these are called disc florets because it's kind of a disc in the center. And those are teeny little flowers too. And so you've got all the standard parts. You've got your stigma, style, ovary, your anthers, your filaments, but they're absolutely, you know, you see that there's can be up to hundreds of them inside of that core area there. So that's why um, it's called a composite flower because it's lots of small flowers. And that's going to be your, I think it's probably obvious, but your sunflowers and your, your black-eyed Susans, and those are all an asteraceae or compositae and would be composite flowers. Um, another type of flower is called a catkin, and these tend to be less showy because they're wind-pollinated, and I should mention that uh, one of the reasons plants are showy or smell bad, like the, the giant flower I showed you, is that they're attracting some uh, you know, bat, a bird, or uh, more often bee to pollinate them. But the, if they're wind pollinated, they don't need to be all that showy because the wind like, doesn't seem to care. And so um, you have these kinds of structures. And if you, I think people are probably familiar with the pussy willows, and those would be a type of catkin. And they, if you look at this, you can see that this is just a whole bunch of filaments and answer, anthers. So it's a cluster of really uh, simplified reduced flowers and they're all male. And then if you look at this, this is uh, the female version of the catkin and that's um, all little teeny weeny female flowers all clustered together. And these uh, are, so there's all males on flowers and all females on flowers, so they would be considered dioecious. And they, uh, when plants are dioecious, they can have, you know, the females on different plants and males on, um, another plant, or in the case of pines, they'll often have uh, female cones and male cones. So anyway, that those are called catkins, and cottonwoods and aspen also have catkins. Another common flower type is the raceme, and, or, I mean, sorry, inflorescence type. So you've got a central stalk, and then little pedestals coming off with the single flowers, or these can be a little more complex than branches as well, but just the kind of, kind of the flower stalk you see quite a bit. This is white camas. Uh, moving on, then uh, there's a whole bunch of seed and fruit types. And again, these are useful for identification. I think particularly if you're doing winter or dormant season identification, seeds can really be a lifesaver. Um, if they aren't on a tree, you can dig around in the ground and figure out what kind of tree or shrub you have. We'll talk about those a bit. and. Um, one seed type that's common to the Midwest because maples and ash are common is the Samara, which is, I think, kind of a beautiful word too. Um, and those are your, your helicopter seeds. So with maples, they tend to be double. Um, and then with ash, so green ash, black ash, white ash, you'll have a single Samara, a single seed. And um, with green and black and white ash, which can be a little tricky to tell apart sometimes, the proportion of the seed part to the wing part and the shape can be a useful character for telling those different ash species apart. 
Elms also have a samara. So, you know, as you see in the late spring, these things just pile up because, of course, they're all wind dispersed seeds. And then I just threw this one in for fun. Uh, the Java and cucumber, I've seen these things, and you see the size of this person's hand. I mean, they're, they're huge, but they're also a samara. And it's just kind of a neat example of how you can have plants that are completely unrelated develop the same kind of um, you know, structure for dispersal. This is a huge vine. It has a big uh, like gourd kind of fruit. And then these things just drop out of it. They're pretty cool. Uh, then of course we've got nuts it's are an important uh, part of the plant. And um, I'll just mention that uh, I think especially in the Midwest, acorns can really be a lifesaver when identifying oaks. Um, oaks hybridize, uh, especially between the white and the, I mean, amongst the white and the black groups. And it can be tough to tell them apart. So again, if you can get on the ground and find an acorn, the ratio of the cap to the body of the acorn, the fruit part, whether it has ridges, whether there's stripes, how big it is, in this case a burlock, whether it has these kind of octopusy little things on it, those can, they can really help you determine what kind of oak you've got. Uh, there's a, a lot of different kinds of seeds with, again, a lot of names for the seeds. I'll just mention a few. One is a capitulum, and everybody's familiar with the dandelion. So uh, plants in the asteraceae tend to have this some form of this capitulum where there's a lot of little seeds attached. And if you think about the asteraceae is the composite day, where you have that composite flower, it makes sense. You're going to have a bunch of seeds kind of packed together. A um, couple other kind of neat seeds. I think people are familiar with pods from peas and beans. There's a few neat things about these. They're typical of the legume family. So if you see a pod that, and you're working to identify a plant, good chance, probably high probability, you're in the legume family. So that narrows it down a lot. A couple of fun things about them. If it's a, a, a tick tree foil or desmodium, they're going to have a low mint which is a segmented seed. And if you've hiked in the fall, you've probably got me stuck on your fleece. And that's sort of their dispersal strategy. Probably a little less known is that the some of the legumes like wild lupin, when this pod dries up, it gets really hard and crisp. And at some point it breaks open and pops and, and twists. And when it does that, it does it so fast that it zoom, shoots the seed about another five to 10 feet. And, um, if that's the only means of dispersal, five to 10 feet a year can really help you out. And it's pretty fun to be out in the lupin field in the, in the spring when they're doing this because you kind of hear this little ping, pop, ping, pop. Um, so yeah, so a pod is a several seeded fruit that splits along the two seams at maturity. Then there's a, a, a lot of kinds of fruits. And uh, again, these will be things that will be for, referred to in the botanical keys. So there's things like droops, which would be your classic peach. Uh, berries, which is a tomato. A lot of people maybe don't think uh, tomato is a berry. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then your aggregate fruits like raspberries and strawberries. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the berry. Um, grapes, of course, are a berry in this sense. And it's basically the definition is a fleshy fruit, fruit without a stone or a pit and from a single flower containing an ovary. So if we look at the tomato flower and plant. Um, again, reviewing there's the stigma, the style, and the ovary, but within the ovary are these ovules. And um, you can see looking at the ovules that that then is what forms the tomato and the seeds. And uh, another common fruit is the palm, which would be the apple. And if you recall, when we looked at the rose hip, what we noted was that it was uh, uh, inferior ovary in that the little bit of calyx, which uh, remember is are the sepals. So the little often green parts of the base of um, petals. And they're uh, kind of on top of this fruit. And that because the ovary is below where they were attached. And then uh, also part of the rose family is typically a hypanthium which basically just means this big fleshy part uh, surrounding the seeds. So, yeah. Let's see. And just reminding again that the inferior ovary is um, where you've got the petals 
and the sepals kind of on top of where the ovary is. Okay, let's talk about leaves. So probably one of the first things I do when I find a plant and I want to identify it, if it's in the summer and there's leaves, is I look at, um, are the leaves opposite or alternate? It's just, it's one of those things that can really help push it one way or another as far as identification. So, and here's an example of opposite leaves. And what we mean by that literally is this leaf to go across the stem is opposite of that leaf. And then they kind of twist as they go down the stem, but basically you've got two leaves across from each other. So wild mint is a good example of that. Um, in contrast, alternate leaves, you've got one leaf here, one leaf there, one leaf here, one leaf there. So alternate and uh, flat-topped aster. A lot of the asters um, have alternate leaves. So that's a great character. Um, in addition to being opposite or alternate, another thing to pay attention to with the leaves is they can have what they call sessile or um, petiolate. And what that just means is the leaf is attached pretty much you know, directly to the stem without hardly any little stalk. And this would be an alternate leaved plant with a sessile leaf. Uh, and here would be an opposite leaf plant, and they can have what's called a little petiole, just a little stem on the leaf. And actually, I shouldn't say little because some of these are really long. They can be winged, they can be thorn, there can be glands, all kinds of things going on. But the point is they've got a petiole versus being sessile. So that those are really good characters to, to be aware of. And then there's another kind of leaf arrangement that's, you know, seen on uh, a few different types of plants in our area, and that's whorl. So this is spotted Joe pie weed. And uh, if you look at the drawing here, basically you've got your stem and you've got, you know, three to five, seven, sometimes in some plants, uh, leaves coming out right at the same spot. So that's a whorled leaf arrangement. So you have one whorl here, another whorl there, and so on. Now I mentioned the opposite alternates. One of the first things I look at with um, leaves in the summer, but also if you're doing winter ID, which a lot of times you are, if you're cutting firewood, you'd be often looking at things when there are no leaves. So the bud arrangement is um, good to look at. And that's essentially where the leaves are gonna come out of anyway, right? So if you look at, for example, sugar maple, they will be opposite. Where as compared with basswood, they're gonna be alternate, just like the leaves were up the stem. And uh, it's worth mentioning that in the Midwest, there's exceptions to this, but if you see an opposite buds, start by looking at, to see if it's a maple or an ash. Again, it can be something else, but often, you know, it could be a maple or ash. They're two of the common trees with opposite buds. So that can be a really easy way to get going. And then uh, I'll also note from there, and I'm not getting into this in this talk because it's a whole talk unto itself, but there's tons of bud characters that you could use, okay, so if there was a twig that had opposite buds and you think, oh, it could be a maple or ash, well, how do I know? Well, then there's characters of these buds and the terminal buds and little scars around here that you can get into those details and help you determine that. And there's keys out there for winter twig ID. So just a little bit on that. Okay, then leaf shape is a very common thing that um, is utilized in keys. And um, as you can imagine, there's lots of leaf shapes. They're, these kind of are on page 151 to 155 in the, the book back in the category section. And I'll just give you some examples of a few of these. So a uh, really common tree in our area is uh, cottonwood. And um, the, the scientific name describes the shape as well. So deltoid leaf, which is like triangular or like a river delta. And um, so populus deltoides, so it's got that real triangular shape leaf kind of flat on the bottom. So that would be your deltoid leaf. Another common uh, leaf shape is uh, lanceolate. And just like it sounds, it's lance shape. So wider at the bottom, pointy tip, kind of just tapers. And um, a plant in our area that has that leaf shape is the stinging nettle. That's a fairly common leaf shape, I would say, lanceolate. Um, I want to also show a couple of things for just review. This would be opposite leaf arrangement, because these leaves are across from each other, right? 
And then you wonder what this little teeny leaf is here. Well, that uh, most plants have what's called a stipule. And I shouldn't say most, a lot of plants have a stipule. Sometimes they fall off and you can't see them. And, and so these can be quite elaborate and can be a character, especially in the pea family. So it says, if the key refers to a stipule, we're talking about these little leaves that are at the base of the bigger leaf. Um, another uh, leaf shape is linear. And when they say linear, they do, it's, it, this can be kind of a tricky one because you're like, well, is it long or skinny or not? But they really mean it's long and skinny. So uh, sandbar willow, which is all over the rivers in, uh, in the Midwest here, is long, narrow leaf. So that's going to be a linear leaf. Another plant that has a linear leaf, uh, probably less commonly known to some people, but is the bog aster. And again, very, you know, obviously a long um, and, and narrow leaf. So linear leaf. So some of these terms are not bad, you know, this, that's kind of easy to remember. Um, then a few other ones, uh, sagittate, which basically means arrowhead shape. So there's a plant that grows down in the um, floodplain and backwaters of the Mississippi and some of the bigger rivers and uh, well, eight lake edges, it's a, a broadleaf arrowhead. And that's got a really neat arrowhead shaped leaf. Uh, another leaf shape that you can see is reniform and that's uh, kidney shape. And so this is uh, called viola renifolia, which means kidney shaped violet. Uh, and then uh, another common leaf shape is chordate, which means heart shape. So basically a big old heart shaped leaf. So sagittate, reniform, chordate. Uh, the other thing that botanists get really uh, specific about is the tips of leaves. Uh, it's because there's so many different kinds. Um, and I'll just go over these a little bit, but there's just the way that they taper, um, whether there's an abrupt little thing, whether there's a, a point, like aristidate, aristidate means like a point, uh, point on it. Um, there can be obtuse, which is rounded. So these, these different tip types can come into play in some keys. Similarly, the leaf base can be important um, in identifying plants. And I'll give you a few examples of these. So um, large flowered bellwort, common understory plant in the forest in spring is what's called perfolia. In this case, uh, I think you can see best here, this leaf goes all the way around the stem. So perfolia in that it, it perforates, the stem perforates the leaf. So then again, that plant's easy to tell once you know that character. A uh, couple other ways that you'll see leaves behaving is uh, auriculate and, and, and plexicollis. And basically that refers to either little lobes of the leaf that kind of wrap around the stem. Or in this case, you can see the lobes uh, in New England Aster wrap around and, and just about touch, not the same as this. So um, if you see these terms, you know, okay, I've got to have a leaf that wraps all the way around or no, it's just going to have these little ears on it, which is the auriculate means like ears like oracle. Um, and so those are good characters. Leaf type, this is, this is a pretty important one again for um, plant identification. You can have a simple leaf like in the cottonwood um, or you can have what are called compound leaves. And compound leaves mean this whole thing is a leaf, this whole thing is a leaf, this whole thing is one leaf. And how do we know it's one leaf? Is on the stem, there'd be a bud here, a bud there, a bud there, but no buds here. So it's really about where the bud is. I'll show you a few pictures to make that more clear. So wild lupin is a compound leaf. So these, all these little things are leaflets, which are part of one leaf because the bud is down here at the base of this little stem. Uh, Canadian snake root, same thing. These are all leaflets on a little stem and the buds down here. So that's a compound leaf and it's called palmate because it's kind of like a palm and it all comes out from the center. So palmate compound leaves. And then there's pinnate compound leaves and there you can think of a pinny of a feather. And so then the bud would be here. You can kind of see that's widened out. And then these would be all leaflets along that stem of black walnut. So compound, um, palmate and pinnate leaves. Here's a few more examples of that. So here'd be a, a compound leaf, which is one set of pinnate. Then what you can see with ferns, so you've got this first, first kind of split, 
with these side ones and then it's put again. So that'd be called double E compound. And then ferns being the fancy things they are can actually do triple E compound. So there's the first stock of it, the second, and then the third, uh, actually the third down at this lower frond can be divided too. So that would be um, three times compound. Um, leaf margins, there's just like hairs, there's a whole bunch of different kind of leaf margins. I'll just hit a few of these. So we wanna save time for questions. Uh, some common ones in our area, American elm, the great example of doubly serrate. So serrate just means like kind of sharp teeth on the edge. Like uh, if you were gonna serrate some food, I guess a bread knife might be serrate. Um, but while they say doubly is there's the big serration and then there's a smaller one kind of inside there. So that's doubly serrate. And then remember we talked about the base of the leaves being important. So one of the things with American elm is there'll be an uneven base is, is a common characteristic. So short on one side, longer on the other. So those are, so that's a couple of nice characters to know that's an uh, elm. Oaks uh, would be called lobi, so lots of lobes. And then if there's no hairs, teeth or anything, it's called entire. So there's some different leaf shapes. Uh, sometimes you'll see ciliate, so little hairs just on the edge of the leaf. And that often, uh, like with some of the honeysuckle species is how you tell one species from another. And then there's a whole bunch of different kinds of um, margin edges. This is just one example of crenate. And it's these kind of rounded little edges on um, Creepy Charlie. Uh, we talked about hairs. Uh, when you talk about leaf surface, so a lot of the characteristics for leaf or for leaf surfaces are going to be hairs. But there's a couple other kind of characteristics too. One is uh, it can have a whitish bloom, it's called, or there's, the technical term is glaucus. And so this is the underside of the leaf. And um, it's just kind of a white color. And you can, uh, most of the time when you have that kind of bloom, you can take your thumb and rub it off and it'll kind of come off and you know, okay, that's a, a bloom. and that's a cool character. And then if there's no hairs, it's called glabrous. And so that you have to watch out not getting that confused with glaucus because they're kind of similar terms. And I have to say in this case, you probably could just say no hairs instead of glabrous, but glabrous is, is what we use. <laughs> um, just a couple more things. Um, veination, I'm not gonna go into this too much other than to say, yes, there's a whole bunch of kinds of veins that are talked about too. And, uh, Again, in the references that I, the book or the online ones, there will be images of that. So you can figure that out if that comes up. Just to kind of point out a couple types of veins. So this is dogwood, it has really kind of parallel side veins, but kind of coming off of here in a pinnate form, like feather a little bit, very characteristic of dogwood. Whereas water lily, you can see the veins are coming out from the center, more of a palmate kind of arrangement. So again, the veins, Beans can be a neat character. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I wanna just talk about a few references now, and then we'll get on to questions. So uh, a lot of the photos in the talk, I got permission to use from Minnesota Wildflowers. And if you aren't familiar with them, they're a fantastic organization. It's sustained by donations. Everybody just donates each year to use it. And they have, just phenomenal photos of um, Minnesota native plants, which a lot, maybe a lot of overlap with Iowa and Wisconsin as well. And so um, this is in the handout that was sent out with email. If you didn't get that, then you can contact Lance and he'll get that to you or contact me either way. Um, but great or great uh, site. They, they, they don't have keys there. It's um, just really good descriptions. And so, um, you want to be aware of that and use some of the floras that I'll talk about for actually keying the plants out. Then um, this is a really great online source, the um, Conservation Research Institute, and they have a nice flora uh, glossary. And so it's kind of like the book that I recommend, but it's just more condensed. There's less things in it, but it's online, so it's handy, and it has illustrations. So that's, if you don't wanna get the book and you wanna go online, they, that's a great source. And a couple other ones, the, the second one, and then also Wikipedia has a glossary of plant morphology. So, 
And these are just a few that I found that I like. I'm sure there's tons more out there. So the information is available online for sure. Uh, Iowa has this site, um, I couldn't see it there, but they have a whole bunch of plant databases, links to plant databases that you can um, go to. Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has some great plant databases as well. And so they've got plant encyclopedias and plant communities. And so that's a, a good resource. Um, this is a, a resource that I don't know if a lot of people know about, but if you, and I, I'm not sure if it's available for Wisconsin or Iowa yet, I apologize, but just it is for Minnesota for sure. And it's really awesome. Basically all the plants in the herbarium at the University of Minnesota um, have been entered into this mapping system. And so you can go to a particular county and say, I wanna know all the plants that occur in that county. And so, and you can say, I wanna know their native status, their common name and doo -doo -doo, and boom, it will send you an Excel sheet or you can get a PDF too of all the plants in that county. Or you can even search by sub-county. So if you're in an area and you're like, I wanna learn the plants in this area, you can, it's helpful to have that list so that if you key out a plant and it doesn't occur anywhere in the Midwest, you're like, oh. Um, the thing is, it doesn't have every single plant that occurs there. It's just the plants that have been collected, but it's a really great resource and a really great um, guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned that the other thing this is handy for is that if you're doing a report where you, you'll be having a lot of scientific names, you can use this Excel file as the, the reference for your scientific names to make sure that they're all at least current with this site and spelled correctly. And then also I wanna mention that uh, Golden Hills is just, I took their classes, I think last winter and the winter before they, uh, Tom offers these amazing classes in the winter and it's really fun because it's cold and dark and you get to look at plant pictures and he does a phenomenal job um, at, especially at groups like uh, upcoming is the group Lactuca and per Pernanthes. Uh, to genera and um, he breaks it down and and uh, just gives you the key characters of those groups has great images um, and I would highly recommend it and so these are some of the classes that are coming up there's more than this I just these are the next ones coming up um, this winter uh, so I'd recommend those if you're if you're interested and I think, uh, yeah, I've got a few more minutes. So I want to leave, keep that open for questions. So I'm going to go to, do uh, we have any questions? Everybody's still awake. Um, nobody has typed any yet, but feel free to type okay. in the chat or if you want to unmute and ask a question, you can do that too. We do have a comment saying that uh, someone recommends Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center too. Okay, yep, yeah, that's, yep, yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. Hi, um, my name's Judy. I have a couple of questions. Um, do you know, I have a lot of trouble pronouncing the names of all this terminology and also the scientific names of the plants. And I wondered if you know a resource where they give verbal pronunciations of these scientific terms. That is such a good question. So the question is, if everybody didn't hear it, is how do you pronounce these things? And you know, I they, I will look into that because I haven't looked recently. I looked in the past and I did not find anything. Um, there are some things that are conventions that you kind of learn, like pseudocypress, which is P-S-E-U. You're not going to pronounce the P. Um, but then I've run into people the answer is I don't know, and I haven't found anything yet. And the way that I've learned them is hang out with botanists. And what I've noticed over the years is that you can have four botanists say things differently. So it's not very tidy. However, that said, what, what's your name again? Uh, Judy McKinnon. Well, I want to look into this because, like I said, I did look into it in the past, but not recent. So I'm going to see if I can find something. And I guess it'll go out to everybody then. We'll, we'll see. Because I understand the, I understand the problem. Yeah. Um, my other question is, I need to identify some uh, prairie seedlings uh, this year when they first come up. And they aren't the common ones that there are books on, like compass plant and things like that. And do you know of any good place 
where there would be descriptions or pictures of seedlings? There, there are some references out there and I will post those as well. Yeah, okay. Definitely, there's, there's a, a, a couple good seedling books and there's a couple good sites. So I'll pull those together and send okay. those out. And then also I would just share with you that, remember I alluded to doing some work in gray stories. <laughs> and anyway, the point is there is, there's some there's quite a few character vegetative characters uh -huh. um so some of yeah. those hairs like the uh, pylos hairs and uh venation ligules you're gonna be you're gonna be looking at these vegetative characters so ligules hairs venation serration node characters those are going to be the things that you'll have to uh grab onto right Okay. And and they it can be done, but I will I will add that to the the references that we send out, and that's a that's a great question too because that is a challenging situation and a kind of a common one too. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Thank you. Can yeah. I just reply to that because uh, I'll type it into the chat, but there is a book called the Tallgrass Prairie Center Guide to Seed and Seedling Identification in the Upper Midwest. Now, this may be the very kind of book, Judy, you've got and you've looked at and it doesn't work for you. <laughs> yes. Okay, it is the, well, then never I mind. <laughs> okay. I, I do have it and I appreciate somebody's put it together. It's great. It just doesn't have the species that I need to know, so. Yeah, thank you for that, Carolyn. And, and Carolyn and I were the ones that did the, Carolyn did the grazed sites with me. And you know what I did is I went through, and again, there are some references I can send you, but I went through a few different floras and I pulled out the vegetative characters and, and made kind of a little key so that I could figure those out. And yeah, it was, a, it was tricky, but um, we, we can kind of converse back and forth about that, see if there's some ways you can do that. But thanks, Carolyn, for that reference. Any other we questions? We are a native seedling ID class in March with Tom Rosberg too. Oh yeah, great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Andy says there's a good explanation of Latin pronunciations in Harlow and Harar's textbook on dendrology. Oh, thanks, Andy. Um, did, Andy, can I get that uh, reference from you at some point, and then I'll get it to other people? Yeah, I'll. I'll I know Andy. I'll talk to him. Okay. Get that out to folks. Any other questions? That's all we got right now. Okay. Um, and Lance, if people, if people can contact me directly or if they want to go through you, if a question arises or a reference doesn't make sense or something, I'm happy to help out with that. Okay. Uh, somebody asks, are you leading any plant walks this summer? Um, anything at the North American Prairie Conference, perhaps? Uh, not at the Prairie Conference. I will be teaching some at um, uh, Carolyn and my farm. And also... Um, at the North House Folk School up in Grand Marais. I'll be teaching a three-day um, uh, intro to botany class. So it'll be like an um, expansion of this, but we'll also focus on plant communities and, and we'll get outside and look at plants. So yeah, those are a couple upcoming things and people could just contact me about that if they'd like. And, and again, I the yeah, the classes that Tom Rosenberg teaches are fantastic. I'd highly recommend them. Yeah, thanks for hanging in there with the uh, mass, massive amounts of information I dumped on you. <laughs> I hope you help no, us I'm out. Learning a lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you good to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining, and thanks Cynthia. Yeah, thank you, Lance. Appreciate the the chance to work with you all on this. Lance, how do you get the notes? Um, I'll email it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.